Okay, welcome to the Drug Decriminalization Briefing Series and thank you so much for joining. Um, my name is Hana Sharif Kazemi and I am a Policy Coordinator at Drug Policy Alliance's Office of Federal Affairs. Today's program is the second of two briefings we are hosting on drug decriminalization this week. Please note that today's briefing will be recorded and at 2.05, we will end the recording for audience questions for the last 10 minutes of this briefing. Today, we will be continuing the conversation around decriminalizing drug possession. At our last briefing, we discussed how decriminalizing drug possession is a critical first step for our country to begin addressing drug use as a public health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. We know the implications drug decriminalization can have on public health in the US by looking at other countries that have taken this approach. Portugal, the Czech Republic, and many other countries have decriminalized drug possession and prioritized responding to substance use through health services. And more recently, drug decriminalization has been adopted in British Columbia and even in the US and Oregon. Today, we'll be focusing on Portugal and Oregon to better understand why those places decriminalize drug possession and what its impact on things like public health has looked like. Before we dive in today, I would like to thank the Center for Drug Use and HIV HCV Research, the Center for Opioid Epidemiology and Policy at NYU Langone Health, the Center for Health and Justice Transformation at Rhode Island Hospital and the Albert Medical School at Brown University, and the Yale Program in Addiction Medicine for co-sponsoring this week's briefing series. Now, I'd like to welcome Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey and give her an opportunity to welcome you all to today's briefing. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I wanna thank the Drug Policy Alliance for inviting me here today to speak on one of the most pressing issues facing American society. Substance abuse is an epidemic and the way our nation has addressed it for half a century has resulted only in undue suffering. In 1971, President Nixon declared the so-called war on drugs. And since then, the American prison population has exploded. Racist crime policies have devastated black and brown communities across the country and families have been torn apart and lives have been ruined. Today, one in five incarcerated Americans are locked up for drug offenses. That's almost 400,000 people, about half the size of New Jersey's 12th district. Mass incarceration has little impact on substance abuse. Imprisoning people for simple drug offenses only denies people the healthcare resources that they really need, ultimately resulting in an increased risk of death from overdose. In fact, drug overdose is the leading cause of death among Americans recently released from prison. 52 years and over a trillion taxpayer dollars later, substance abuse is still on the rise. It's long past time that we admit that the war on drugs was not only an abject failure, but a stain on the conscience of our nation. The ongoing addiction epidemic demands that we put an end to the war on drugs and drastically change the way our government approaches substance abuse. I introduced the Drug Policy Reform Act to do just that. In addition to decriminalizing drug possession, my bill would direct the government to end its decades long practice of treating drug use as a criminal issue by pivoting to the health focus approach it demands. On top of this, my bill expunges and seals the records of individuals who have been convicted of drug possession, giving countless wrongfully imprisoned Americans a new lease on life. Contrary to what my colleagues across the aisle would have you believe, this is not a radical proposal, nor is it unheard of. 22 years ago, the Portuguese decriminalized uh, simple drug possession. And like my Drug Policy Reform Act proposes, it shifted to a health-based approach. In the years since Portugal enacted this transformative policy, the population of prisoners incarcerated for drug offenses has fallen dramatically and drug-related deaths have consistently remained below the EU average. After seeing the success of drug decriminalization in Portugal, the state of Oregon enacted a similar policy. And just one year later, over 16,000 
Oregonians have access health services and drug arrests have decreased by 60%. The numbers don't lie. Drug policy reform simply directs government resources to provide health services to individuals with health issues. And over time, that saves lives. That's not radical. What is radical is using those same government resources to weaponize law enforcement for the purpose of shattering black, brown, and low income communities and families. If our nation truly wants to address substance abuse, the answer is compassion, not cruelty. We save lives by treating individuals with health problems like addiction with the care that they need. The world could learn from Portugal's model and the United States could learn from Oregon's. We have the knowledge and the resources to finally end the war on drugs and begin to heal the communities it destroyed. What we need is the political will to do so. And I want to join you and all of our allies in educating our respective states and countries on why this compassionate pivoting from criminalization to health services is the right direction in which to go. Thank you for allowing me to share with you. Thank you so much, Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman, for that warm welcome and update on what states, what steps have been taken at the federal level to decriminalize drug possession. And so with that, uh, let's begin today's presentations. So we'll begin today's briefing with a presentation by Joao Castel Branco Guello. Joao is currently the Portuguese Drugs and Alcohol National Coordinator and Director General of the Intervention on Addictive Behaviors and Dependencies General Directorate, the body within the health ministry responsible for policy coordination in this field. He was chairman of the European Monitoring Center on Drugs and Drug Addiction from 2009 to 2015. Joao is also the chair of the Pompidou Group of the Council of Europe and has held this position since 2019. A medical doctor by profession, Dr. Guao has over 20 years of experience working on drug-related issues. He was also a member of the Portuguese Committee, which, in 1999, prepared the report that included a decriminalization proposal and was the basis for the Portuguese drug strategy. Today, Joao will be presenting on this policy, what led to Portugal's decision to decriminalize drug possession 20 years ago, and what its impact has been since its passage. So Joao, take it away. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thanks to, to, to the Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, I, I want to greet all my uh, all the participants and also Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman for uh, her kind words about our, uh, our model of intervention. <clears throat> which I, I will try to uh, to share with you. Um, I hope that I, I managed to do it. Uh, sorry. Uh, so. I think my screen is already there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Just have to press present. Uh, okay. Thank you. Well, I I will try to explain you uh, how we came to the to the decision of decriminalizing uh, drug use and possession for use in Portugal but also to give you an idea of the, the responses that we have uh, put in place uh, prior and uh, after that decision that was taken in 2000. Uh, I want to start by saying that our policies uh, are very uh, worldwide known, mostly uh, because of that uh, decision of decriminalizing, but uh, in my view, this is, of course, a very important step. But what is, it is an integrated approach, uh, public health oriented approach to the drugs phenomenon. Uh, and that's uh, what I, I will try to share with you. Uh, I would like to address uh, those points drug decriminalization, determinants, and policies. 
uh, the integrated approach to drug problems, an overview of Portugal's policy uh, components. Uh, share with you some evolution of core indicators and uh, some lessons that we have learned from our, our experience. Uh, it's important to, to, to share with you some historical facts. The drugs phenomenon, uh, at least as a mass phenomenon at, as it happened later, started in Portugal much later than in most of the, the European countries. As you know, we lived for a long time uh, under a dictatorship, uh, Salazar maybe sounds to you, and during that period, uh, drugs were not an issue in our society. Of course, there were some people who used drugs, but it was not a massive phenomenon as it became later. Uh, so it happened with relevance only after the Portuguese Democratic Revolution in 74, the Carnation Revolution, when society was facing deep and accelerated changes. There was some association of drug use to the concept of freedom. Uh, we had the return of soldiers and settlers from uh, the Portuguese ancient colonies, Angola, Mozambique, and so on, where <clears throat> where drug use was tolerated a little bit like the Americans in Vietnam uh, in order to keep people alienated, uh, participating in a war that most of them did not agree upon. Uh, and suddenly everything changed in, in our society. It turned a very interesting emerging market for criminal organizations. Uh, so suddenly we had everything available in, in the market. There was a generalized uh, experimentation uh, and it was easier to shift from one to other uh, drugs by lack of literacy. While in other countries, it was possible to um, develop some uh, preventive work to, to, to share information about drugs year uh, we had no time for that and the state was paying attention to other kind of issues we had a very fast diff diffusion of drug use among delinquents and the socially excluded but in fact uh, uh, the drugs phenomenon was cross-cutting all social groups and in my view this is key to understand why we were able to develop a, a, a progressive uh, approach to this uh, to this new phenomenon in any case in the late 90s uh, we could see this kind of scenes in lisbon in the 90s with the very marginalized groups of of people using in using substances in a very degradating uh, circumstances In 98, uh, when our first uh, national strategy was built, cannabis was by far the most used substance. Heroin was uh, uh, ca causing the most problematic drug use. There was a lot of uh, mixed use of heroin and cocaine, uh, cocaine alone. Uh, intravenous drug use, uh, was very common sharing of injecting material uh, and uh, HIV had spread uh, very very hardly in this uh, in these groups. We had a quite important number of overdoses there, some criminality related to to drug use. We never had a very heavy and violent criminality related to drugs, but. Uh, PT crimes, acquisitive crimes were very present in our society and very nuisant for everyday life. Uh, and uh, around this, uh, this date, 98, we estimate that we could have 1% of the population, that means around 100,000 problematic drug users, mostly using heroin. In, in 98, Drug and drug-related issues were the main concern of uh, uh, of the Portuguese population. We had 
1% of the population using drugs in a problematic way. That means 100,000. 98 of them, 98% of them were heroin users and 48% of them uh, used uh, intravenously. They contributed for 56% of eight, all HIV notifications in, in the country. And we had an average uh, number of uh, overdoses deaths each year of 350. We started to develop since the beginning of those, of those problems, some uh, responses, uh, mostly uh, on mostly uh, health-oriented responses. Uh, curiously, uh, the first treatment centers uh, in the three major cities were created in 75 under the Ministry of Justice. And then several developments happened uh, and the, the centrality of the approach moved into the Ministry of Health in 1990. Uh, uh, in 93, we started the, uh, the needle and syringe exchange program. The MCDDA, the European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction, which is an European agency, was implanted in Lisbon. And our drug uh, drugs law, the, the, the decree law 15 uh, of 93, was published is still in place, this law, uh, except the article that deals with the personal use and possession for use that was changed by the decriminalization law, law 30 of 2000. We had in 97 a very important uh, law, the law 7 of 97, which defines the public network of treatment, inpatient and outpatient treatment centers, nationwide, uh, the nationwide coverage, uh, uh, the regulation of private units and the establishment of, uh, of, of the, 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 the number of, uh, of uh, inhabitants that should be served by each one of those, of those units. <clears throat> so we developed an integrated approach uh, uh, to drugs prob pro problems. Uh, uh, and the response for those problems were mainly a new strategy that was approved in 99, a national coordination, uh, interministerial coordination that today encompasses 11 ministries. All, almost all the government is involved in drug-related policies. Uh, we established a new paradigm, the Law 30 of 2000, which is the law of the criminalization. We established a, a national network of intervention facilities and a, a new intervention model. The first uh, Portuguese uh, national strategy on drugs uh, stands on two main principles, the principle of humanism and the principle of pragmatism. It has two sides, two, uh, the supply reduction side and the demand reduction where prevention, treatment, harm reduction, social reintegration and decriminalization that makes the bridge between the supply and demand reduction. And all that together, uh, 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 is what we, we call uh, an integrated uh, uh, approach. In any way, the criminalization of drug use shall be understood as one of the components of the comprehensive drug policy, and it's not, it's not the policy uh, itself. The new paradigm led us to um, the decriminalization of drug consumption. It was elaborated, uh, it was different from the Portuguese drug strategies in the past that were based on a policy of consumption criminalization. But we understood that imprisonment or fee, the most common sentence imposed on first time offenders, didn't solve drug, the drug abuse and uh, contributed very little to, 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 to counter the phenomenon. 
In the case of the of first time offenders or occasional users, imprisonment is likely to generate counterproductive productive effects, and we understood that. And we had a need to liberate resources for the fight against drug trafficking. So the law that is a result of the strategy and changes only uh, one article of the drugs law of 93 that refers to personal use. And it states that, states that the consumption, acquisition and possession for own consumption of plants, substances or preparations constitute an administrative offense. And there's a, a threshold, there's a limit. Possession cannot exceed the quantity previewed for individual use for a 10 days period. Exceeding this quantity, criminal procedures take place as before. The drug uh, addict is considered as a person in need of health and social care. And the dissuasion intervention, this is the, 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 the device that we created to, to deal with this, uh, uh, with the, the, the application of this new law, it provides an opportunity for an early, specific, and in integrated interface with people who use drugs. So we consider it as an indicate prevention tool. It is aimed and targeted to the drug user's characteristics and individual needs. <clears throat> We have one of those commissions for dissuasion of drug addiction, one on each district. We have 18 districts, but it's important to, to say that the drug use uh, is still forbidden. Uh, it falls in a administrative procedure. Uh, and unlike models from other countries where drug courts were created with the facilitated procedures under the Ministry of Justice, the commissions for dissuasion of drug addiction privilege the health approach. They are bodies under the custody of the Ministry of Health. The main objectives of this uh, dissuasion system is to dissuade the consumption. We call it a second line of preventive intervention, the, the, the yellow card that the referee shows to the, to the player. It promotes uh, uh, user social reintegration. It fosters users information and awareness about drug consumption risks. It is possible to develop motivation and referral of drug addicts to treatment. And uh, in general, the promotion of health in all, in, in all the aspects. Uh, the, the procedures, well, someone is intercepted by a police authority using drugs or in possession of drugs uh, in a public place in, uh, by the police, is caught, uh, it goes to the police station. The police elaborates a report uh, and uh, sends the, the user uh, to the commission within a maximum delay of 72 hours. At the commission, there's a psychological and social evaluation, a hearing of the user, and the decision that may be uh, the application of a penalty. Uh, I insist, uh, uh, an administrative penalty. There's no place for a criminal record that stands for life and stigmatizes the person for the rest of their days and turns some aspects of their lives uh, much more difficult. Uh, and the, there's a, a, an assessment uh, of the situation regarding drug use, uh, psychosocial situation, previous register, and on face of that, we try to assess what are the real needs of that of that citizen. Of course, it only works if we have a coordination between services with responsibilities in this area. Uh, from the addiction treatment center to the health center, welfare services, prisons, indicate prevention structures, schools, police authorities, employment and training services. So uh, the commission, each one of those uh, 18 commissions established uh, its own net local network 
for where to to refer the the the, the persons that, that they have in front of them there is a long list of uh, uh, decisions and sanctions the most used is the provisional process suspension but uh, it may have a warning uh, to have a decision of periodic presentation to the CDT, to the health center or treatment center for addictions, uh, community service, forbidden of attending certain places or meeting certain people, uh, and so on. Monetary fee, for instance, is only used for non-addicted people. So there's a long list of uh, possible sanctions, but it is possible to define sanctions according to the personal lifestyle and conditions of, of the citizen. As a result of this uh, activity, I, I want to show you this, these numbers. Since 2001 until 2021, we had uh, around 154,000 offenders. Uh, present to the commissions. 85,000 of them were uh, assessed as non-problematic drug users. But even then, they had some kind of uh, issue that needed some support, some help. For instance, if I have someone that say, oh, drugs are not, are not a a problem in my life, I smoke a joint of uh, cannabis on weekends with my friends, but my parents are divorcing, or my father just lost his job, or myself, I have uh, had in the last, uh, in the last months, last years, some uh, psychological uh, difficulties. So the commission may invite the person to join any kind of specialized support not necessarily uh, in a center for the for the treatment of drug addiction but to other kind of responses is, is existing in society so from this 85000 45000 were addressed to specialized support for other issues uh, rather than to the uh, 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 drug related problems from the 16,000 problematic drug users that were assessed by those commissions, 12,000 were addressed to treatment teams uh, for addiction, and 10,000 actually initiated a treatment in those centers. So this is a supplementary gate uh, to, the, to the system of treatment. Of course, people can address this system spontaneously, but this is a supplementary uh, way to 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 enter the system. So we call this uh, the public health approach, uh, 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 integrated and coordinated uh, approach, where prevention, treatment, reintegration, harm reduction, all together with dissuasion and also with the supply reduction, developed by police and customs authorities led us to to some to to the evolution that we have felt of course we did not solve all the drugs problems in our society but we we have improved quite a lot in the last 20 years of course there is a treatment uh, available in an integrated manner in order to reduce the drug related health and social consequences and we have uh, uh, targeted also some subpopulation with special needs, uh, improving access to adapted treatment programs, such as the elderly, so women, pregnant women, and so on. We have a quite solid network of uh, treatment facilities, uh, a public uh, a public network complemented by regulated NGO and private responses that articulate with the official responses uh, and we have the capacity to to pay for the services that the private uh, responses supply to us so 
22 centers for, for integrated responses with the treatment, harm reduction, prevention, and reintegration. On top of that, 45 drug treatment teams, uh, three public therapeutic communities, plus 60 NGO or private with uh, 1,600 beds, some detoxification units, they, they centers, alcohol units, uh, and uh, uh, along with this, we had uh, those commissions for dissuasion of drug addiction. On the side of uh, harm and risk reduction, uh, there's a, a, a set of uh, different strategies and programs, such as opioid substitution ter therapy with low threshold methadone administration and other drug dependent treatments, needle exchange program, counseling, diagnosis, and referral to treatment of drug addiction, but also of uh, infectious diseases, information, education, and communication based on peer education and, and mostly developed in, in on party scene, condom distribution, uh, uh, work in prisons and other detention settings, uh, drug checking, uh, in order to better understand what is actually circulating in the market. Uh, so, and the structures that we, we have for, to do that are street teams, mobile outreach teams for the prevention of infectious diseases. We have refugees and shelters, drop-in centers, contact and information points where the drug checking is possible cabinets of psychosocial support. And starting recently, uh, we have uh, three supervised drug consumption rooms. One in one fix in Lisbon, uh, along with a mobile one, a van that circulates in the city, and a, a quite recent drug consumption room, fix one in Oporto, the second city of, of, uh, of the country. There's a, 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 the work on reintegration that starts from the very beginning of the of the so of of the treatment process. It stands on a social diagnosis uh, uh, with uh, several dimensions: from housing, education, work, and training, family and relationships, recreation and leisure, citizenship. And uh, for each patient, we establish an indiv individual reintegration plan uh, with the, the, based on a discussion with the patient, aiming the subject's autonomy. And uh, uh, we perform a support and follow-up and the social mediation during all the process. With this, we have a quite uh, positive evolution of, of core indicators. Just to share some with you and to and comparing with the 1998, we are finding where when we had one percent of the population as uh, problematic drug users, nowadays we estimate that we can have 0, 0,33 uh, percent of the population with problematic use. That means instead of 100,000 people, uh, around 33,000 problematic users. From those that used to be 98% heroin users, nowadays we have 16% of them are heroin users. 48% used to use the intravenous route, nowadays only 2% of them uh, inject uh, drugs. They used to contribute for 56% of HIV new cases. Uh, currently, we have 3% of new cases among injecting drug users. And from the 350 overdoses deaths, as average in the 90s, we had in 2021, we had 74 overdoses deaths. <clears throat> This graph shows the, the evolution of overdoses deaths uh, in the last years. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, that rate because the methodology is different from the one that we use today. 
uh, but we had in 2008-94 overdoses deaths, had a period of very low numbers, and nowadays uh, this number is increasing. Uh, we are still in very no absolute, very low absolute uh, numbers, but uh, there's a trend of uh, growing, and we are quite concerned in trying to to change this uh, evolution uh, by uh, this having, for instance, uh, uh, nixoid available on the street and uh, by other means trying to invert this. One of the indicators uh, is the HIV infection. You can see the evolution of HIV infections among infectious uh, uh, injecting drug users uh, and in other groups, heterosexual, uh, men, uh, um, homosexual, male homosexuals. And you can see that uh, today, injecting drug users contribute the less for the, the uh, total number of new infections each year in, in our country. This uh, uh, graph shows the evolution of the number of, uh, of uh, uh, patients in treatment in the year by, by year. Uh, we had the peak in 2008 and 9, and from the, since then it is decreasing. We are including here patients that search treatment for alcohol uh, problems, alcohol related problems. Those are the new patients by by year. Since 2003, there was a drop, and now we have a quite low number of new patients every year. <clears throat> this is the main substance of patients who initiated treatment in the year by year. New patients uh, in 2021 were mostly uh, cannabis users. Uh, followed by cocaine and heroin has been dropping uh, in the in the scope of, of the newcomers, the people who search uh, uh, treatment for the first time. In the readmitted, uh, we have heroin is still the most uh, most present uh, uh, substance. Uh, uh, it is uh, related to relapses and to uh, other kind of problems uh, that appear. So uh, we have a steady increase of the importance of cocaine and uh, recently crack cocaine in our uh, uh, in our figures. <clears throat> This is the evolution of the administrative offenses uh, related to drug use law and the evolution of inmates convicted under the drug law, the, the, the law 15 of 93. So it has also dropped uh, 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 in the proportion of, of the prisoner population. There's a decrease in <clears throat> drug-related offenses. So, to sum up, uh, I would like to show you that uh, since 2001, we had small increases on illicit drug use among adults, not a problematic use, but uh, the general use uh, among adults. A reduction and delay in experimentation of illicit drug use among adolescents a reduction of injecting drug use, a reduction of opiate-related deaths and infectious diseases, a reduced number of drug offenders on the criminal justice system. It contributed to a reduced stigma of drug users, an increase in the amounts of drugs seized by the authorities, and this means that they do not need to use uh, the users as a source of information to be efficient in seizing drugs. They had to, to learn how to, how to work differently and to, to pick other sources 
of information and instead of seizing uh, small amounts of substances on the street they seize big uh, bulk bulk shipments in uh, in big operations of course they need to cooperate with international counterparts with intelligence but in fact today our police and customs authorities are the happiest uh, people uh, in the world to, with this system the bad thing with this is that as uh, we solved uh, or uh, we managed to keep uh, most of those problems uh, uh, out of sight there was a drop in the ranking of social and political priorities and uh, quite re relevant uh, disinvestment uh, in this area uh, so we are now facing some difficulties to keep the level of efficiency that we had in other times. Joao, I just want just to, have to move okay. on to Megan's presentation. I apologize. Okay, for uh, okay. this is the last one. Uh, just to tell you that uh, what we feel about our system is that it introduced coherency in a system that considers more important treating than punishing. It was considered in the beginning by the United Nations as uh, it, it, it was uh, opposed by the United Nations, <clears throat> but nowadays they consider the Portuguese model as a model of best practices in accordance with the spirit of the treaties. In our view, it's important to, to have a, an objective criteria to distinguish from criminal procedures in terms of quantities of, of, of drugs. And uh, we also consider very important the complementarity of public and private responses and uh, the importance of the regulatory function of the state uh, to, to, to have uh, quality responses. Thank you very much. And I apologize. I, I, I'm aware that I took too long, but uh, okay, I could not skip this opportunity to, to share uh, this information with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joao. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I hope with that, with this presentation, folks are able to see that decriminalizing drug possession has been used as an effective response to re record-breaking incarceration rates, overdose deaths, and other, other public health crises for over 20 years in Portugal. And importantly, this presentation demonstrates how drug possession decriminalization has not only prevented overdose deaths and viral infections, but has also helped people who use drugs receive the health services they need when and if they want it. And Portugal is just one of the many international examples of decriminalizing drug possession. So while Portugal can give us insight into some of the long-term successes and possibilities of decriminalizing drug possession, we are now going to turn to a different model that is currently being implemented in the United States. In 2021, decriminalization of drug possession took effect in Oregon. The state's groundbreaking Measure 110 ballot initiative made Oregon the first state in the nation to decriminalize personal possession of all drugs and allocate hundreds of millions of dollars annually to greatly expand access to health services. With our next presentation, we'll be exploring what Measure 110 is, what research has been done so far on its impact on health and safety, and learn more about how Measure 110 will support people who use drugs in Oregon. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next two presenters. First, we'll be hearing from Tara Hurst, the Executive Director of the Health Justice Recovery Alliance. As Health Justice Recovery Alliance's Executive Director, she is helping lead the effort to implement Measure, measure 110 in Oregon. Uh, before starting at Health Justice Recovery Alliance, Tara was the Executive Director of Renew Oregon, where she successfully worked with the governor, state legislature, community groups, foundations, and businesses to pass the most ambitious climate action in Oregon's history. And previously, Tara served as the Chief of Staff for the Mayor of Portland and in leadership roles in the Oregon State Legislature. Welcome, Tara. And our second presenter will be Dr. Alex Kral. Dr. Alex Kral is an epidemiologist and distinguished fellow at the nonprofit Health Research Institute, RTI International. He has been conducting policy-directed research on illicit drug use and its attendant health, attendant health consequences in the United States for three decades. He has published over 200 papers in top peer-reviewed journals and is currently the principal investigator and co-investigator on several National Institute on Drug Abuse funded projects. He's also leading a large-scale Arnold Ventures support evaluation of the impact of Oregon's Measure 110. 
So with that, I'll pass it to Tara to begin the presentation on Measure 110. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, I'm going to jump right in because we have a lot to cover and I'll try and cover as much as possible. Um, this is obviously a really important conversation and can uh, take hours for us to have these conversations. So uh, most of you know, we decriminalize drugs in Oregon, small amounts of drugs um, in Oregon, as Hannah said, in 2020. And so we're just going to give you a little bit of how it's going and some lessons learned. Uh, here's my contact info. So how it started, um, you know, basically Oregon was and still is about last in access to services and with the highest addiction rates in the country. And so really Oregonians were tired of waiting for the legislature to step up and, and treat folks who were struggling with substance use. So they took it in their own hands and, and created a pretty much a voter mandated um, moving substance use from a criminal response to a healthcare response, much like uh, Portugal. We had uh, <clears throat> the campaign that ran the um, ballot measure was the most comprehensive and diverse campaign with the most uh, organizations backing it. And today we have many of those partners and have really worked to ensure getting a lot of folks who maybe weren't as um, signed on to the policy, but really wanted to make sure that the implementation went well, really cares deeply about making sure that um, as we stand up services that we're doing it in the, in the best way possible and really focusing on our communities who have been most impacted by the war on drugs. And in Oregon, that really is um, our uh, African-Americans, Latino, uh, indigenous, tribal, and native communities. And so that's what we've been focused on and making sure that we set up our services to center them. But this is just a good um, idea of the folks that are part of our coalition. So what does Measure 110 do? Uh, it decriminalizes but doesn't legalize a small amount of personal use of drugs, uh, and we'll go over what that looks like in a second. And it invests hundreds of millions of dollars into recovery and harm reduction services. So basically it takes the uh, revenue from our cannabis tax, the first 90 million still goes to the same services that had been originally allocated from the passage of Measure 91, which was the legalization of cannabis. Anything over those funds, sorry, uh, anything over those funds goes into the Drug Treatment and Recovery Fund. And for this biennium, that was $300 million, which is about five times more than Oregon has ever spent on these types of services. It also established an oversight and accountability council, which is really people with lived experience who are allocating these services and the funds. And this is critical because they are the folks who actually know what's needed on the ground and, and understand the services that we need to be really focused on. Um, and for some rates, okay, there we go. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as we've heard already, this is really about making sure that we're looking at substance use through a healthcare lens and not a criminal justice lens. So the services that are now in every county in Oregon um, are low barrier treatment, peer supported recovery, harm reduction services, and then supportive transitional and long-term housing. So that's where the $300 million went. And if we have time, I will go over kind of how those services are working. This just gives you a good idea of what the um, Class E violation, which is what Measure 110 set up. So instead of getting a misdemeanor as you would have prior to the passage of Measure 110, now you get a Class E violation, which is basically a ticket um, that is in line with a, you know, a traffic violation um, that has, a phone number that you can call, that you can get a health screening from a peer on from Lines for Life, and basically just go through a quick health screening to see, do you need more services? Would you like to be connected to more services? And if the answer is no, then the $100 fine is waived and you can continue on. If the answer is yes, they're going to connect you with somebody in your local community who can start helping 
build a support network and a, a reintegration uh, plan for you, whether that's housing, whether that's needing to see primary care, a peer support, um, you know, these services are really meant to be uh, meeting folks where they're at and ensuring that there is no wrong door to access. And this just gives you an idea of kind of what the first two years of implementation looked like. Uh, you know, we decriminalized February 1st, 2021. The first round of grants came out in 21, June of 2021. And we now, as of September of last year, have all of these behavioral health resource networks, which is all those services that I just went over, available in every county. And because our, all of our counties are different, um, they all look different. And that was really important for us is to make sure that we aren't creating a cookie cutter model, but we're really meeting folks where they're at and making sure that we have the right services in every area so that folks can um, access them. And they are free for anyone to receive. You don't need a citation in order to get to those funds. I think that's you, Alex. Okay, thank you so much, Tara. And uh, thank you, DPA, for um, inviting me to, uh, to speak today. Uh, let's see if I can get my uh, presentation going here. Let's see. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so I'm going to be uh, talking a bit about uh, uh, the evaluation that we've been conducting and that's part of a, a four-year evaluation for us that we'll, we'll be doing qualitative data collection, quantitative data collection, secondary analysis, and, and finally a budget impact analysis. And the idea is essentially that you would think that the law would decrease drug uh, law enforcement encounters, uh, it would increase substance use treatment and harm reduction services, which in turn would decrease drug use uh, and health-related complications of drug use, and that would all feed into essentially a budget um, impact analysis after that. Um, I'm going to move uh, through a bit quickly here, uh, but um, we first did a qualitative study because, uh, as Tara mentioned, the uh, treatment aspect of this wasn't fully funded until just last September. And so what we really started to look at here is really decriminalization aspect and the crime aspect of this particular law uh, at this point. And so we did a qualitative um, study of um, in four different counties in, in Oregon, uh, where we interviewed uh, staff and leadership of law enforcement, criminal legal system, EM, uh, EMS, fire, and community agencies. Um, and basically what we found from law enforcement was that they felt concerned that the law didn't have any consequences, they felt. It had no teeth, no leverage. Um, they felt that it was it had taken away a key investigative tool from them. Um, they were concerned that the Class E violations uh, you know, weren't be being taken seriously. Um, and, and ultimately, what they were really concerned about the law, for law enforcement was that it was really um, that there was that they, they, they felt that there must be an increase in violent property and disorderly crimes. Um, so that led us to do uh, two different studies, one um, about uh, using calls for service data and one using crime data. I'm going to give uh, some data on each of those. But essentially, um, when people call 911 calls for service, uh, you know, they, you could get a data from that, a record from that. And so we compared Portland data to three neighboring cities in states that didn't have uh, Measure 110, so Seattle, Boise, and Sacramento. Um, and there was, in those four cities, there was over 4 million calls for service. And so we were able to look over time to see how those may have changed. Um, and so what you'll see here in the first graph here, and you've got calendar time uh, that's going along the bottom here. And then you'll see that the BM 110 was enacted in February 2021. And so that's the line, uh, the vertical line you see. Uh, in black, you've got Portland's data. And so this is all the total calls of service uh, to 911 uh, in Portland, if you look at the black one, black lines. And you see that it didn't really change much uh, after uh, ballot measure 110 was enacted. And in fact, it looked very similar to uh, both Seattle, uh, and while it was lower than the Sacramento data, that the, the basic periodicity of it was very similar uh, to that. Um, so we dug deeper a little bit, looking at disorder calls specifically. And what you see here again, the black line is Portland. Um, and you see that there's not an increase 
in disorder, uh, public disorder calls uh, from, from, from people um, there. Um, we looked at property crimes as well, uh, calls for property crimes. Uh, there may have been some increase in that afterwards. Uh, it, some of that's seasonal, but it also looks very similar to what we've seen in Seattle. Um, and then finally, we looked at vice calls. Uh, and again, the black line is, is Portland, and you see that it, it didn't increase uh, any 911 calls um, for, um, for vice calls uh, either. Um, so then we took to, uh, turned to crime uh, incident data uh, analysis, basically using the FBI National Incident-Based Reporting System, which is called NIBRS for short, um, which offers essentially all the data on a uh, full range of violent property and drug-related crimes uh, in those state in these states, and it provides uh, you know asset uh, you know a way to look at the volume of reportable offenses. And so what we did here was we compared Oregon to neighboring states of. Colorado, uh, Idaho, Montana, and Washington to see what happened again over time using the same timeline here um, there as well. And so again, you see timeline on the on the bottom here. You see a vertical line for, for February 2021 when uh, ballot measure 110 was enacted. And again, Oregon here is the black line. And what you see is certainly over time, there really hasn't been appreciately anything has changed here in, in total crime uh, rate before or after, and this is a rate per, per 100,000, which is why these look a lot more similar to each other, as opposed to call for service data, which was was, was full volume. Um, so what you see here, again, is um, th there hasn't been an increase in crime, in total crime here. Um, if you look at property uh, crime specifically, um, you see that's got some seasonality to it going up and down, but it hasn't really changed very much, and it's very much in line with what's happening in neighboring Washington uh, and Colorado. Um, and then I uh, look at violent crimes. Um, you know, it really is uh, it's fairly flat here after after uh, B1, BM110 is enacted. Um, and finally, the drug crime rate um, has of course gone down some way. That's part of the part of the, the recent rationale for for um, for, for uh, decriminalizing um, uh, drugs here. And so we're not surprised it's gone down. But but it wasn't very high a very high rate to begin with, and and really mirrors what was happening in the other um, in the other states as well. So just a summary here, law enforcement in Oregon felt strongly that there, that there, was, a, there was a host of problems associated with, with uh, ballot measure 110, but the 911 calls for data, uh, service data don't bear out the law enforcement perceptions. Um, the public in Portland did not alter their 911 calls for service post, uh, post uh, M M110, um, and 911 uh, calls for service in Portland really tracked similar to cities in neighboring states that didn't have measure 110. Uh, similarly, uh, the crime data, the, the changes in crime incidents pre and post were very similar in Oregon to comparison states that didn't have uh, ballot measure 110. Um, there were some increases in crime incidents in Oregon uh, in comparison states in 2021 uh, that was contemporaneous to the enactment of, of measure 110. Uh, but these changes may be due, due to seasonal fluctuation in COVID more so. Our data show it definitely was not uh, associated with uh, ballot measure 110. Um, so and and then we see that drug crime incidents did decrease in 2021, uh, but were also uh, already fairly low, uh, possibly because of some um, because of de facto decriminalization in some of the largest cities uh, in in Oregon even prior to uh, this study period. Um, so in the conclusion, then um, the first year of drug de decriminalization in Oregon brought concern from law enforcement, um, but uh, about increases in crime, but they were not borne out in calls for service or crime incident data. It'll be important to assess whether these encouraging trends continue in the coming years. Um, we, we feel strongly that all evaluations of uh, ballot measure 110 should include comparison states and cities the way that we did here. Um, and finally, a comprehensive evaluation of ballot measure 110, including assessing its impact on drug use, substance use disorder treatment, drug related or, uh, morbidity and mortality, and budgets shouldn't be conducted until there's been a sufficient time for implementation of substance use disorder treatment and harm reduction services, which really just started last um, last fall. So I just want to acknowledge uh, this was uh, probably supported by uh, all ventures. And I want to thank some of the co-authors and some of the contributors to this. And I'm going to turn it right back over to Tara. All right, let's go back to some of the fun stuff, how it's going. So how's it going? Uh, you know, for us, we would say that even though it's had a rocky um, start, as people have seen in the media, I'm sure, ultimately, when you're actually working on the ground on this, 
It's been pretty amazing. Uh, 60,000 Oregonians have received life-saving services, uh, and that was as of September of 2022. Um, and I can't change. There we go. So here's a timeline. We're trying to make this a little less complicated, if possible, on our funding, because that's really where a lot of folks um, have been focused, and as they should, we're trying to connect more people with services, and how is that going? So in July of 21 through September of 2022, we had about $40 million went out to 66 providers. And within that time frame, we had 42,000 people were served with these dollars. Um, those are harm reduction, housing, low barrier treatment, supported employment, all of these types of critical services that we know when you wrap these around folks, they are more likely to um, be able to kind of get onto a path of recovery. Uh, then you look at in where we're at now, which are the behavioral health resource networks that were set up um, through 110 is $265 million were awarded to 160 organizations across the state. And that's 42 of these behavioral health resource networks. And so far, and just from, it's actually May through September of 2022, 17,000, basically 18,000 people have been served. Those were the smaller Oregon counties, our more rural counties, because they were a little less complicated to get the awards out to. So you can only imagine when the numbers come in from some of our more populated counties like Multnomah, Washington, Clackamas, and Lane County. Uh, and because things got a late start, there is going to be grant extensions, um, which because of our revenue, um, the cannabis revenue is down considerably this next biennium. We're looking at about $150 million that will go out to all of these organizations and give them a little more stability to be able to provide these incredible services that they're providing. Um, this gives you a sense of what those first 42,000 folks were um, accessing. And remember, this was only about 10% of the funds with only 60 um, organizations. Now we have 160 organizations and $265 million. So it's pretty incredible. Here's some of the uh, headlines that, that we've seen over, over the time. And here's the most important. This shows you really who's getting the funding and how that's impacting. So the Oregon Change Clinic was able to renovate a whole space of a motel and turn it into an addiction recovery services. In uh, Douglas County, which is rural Oregon, we, they received eight and a half million dollars to um, provide, you know, these life-saving uh, services with um, housing, peer support, harm reduction services, and they're really growing out their services as well. This shows you in Umatilla counties, Morrow counties, $5 million for folks who are on this call from Oregon, you know how important um, these types of dollars going into these counties are. And having access to all of these support services is critical. Centro Americano is an incredible organization that's been able to expand um, significantly under Ballot Measure 110. And they're one of our only linguistically specific service providers in the state. And we're working really hard with them and Northwest Instituto Latino to ensure that we really are building out our linguistically and culturally specific care because that is really critical, obviously, when you are trying to engage folks in services and give them uh, non-judgmental trauma-informed care. This goes over a couple more. Um, in the Central Oregon area, Jackson County, Southern Oregon, $17.5 million. And then this was a, um, a some a public research done in the late summer of 2022, uh, basically, you know, checking in how do voters still feel like about Measure 110. And as you can see here, 58% of voters still support um, us treating addiction as a healthcare issue and not a criminal issue, which is exactly the same amount of folks that voted in favor of 
ballot measure 110. So there's a lot of noise out there, but when you actually talk to voters, this was um, still their, their feelings on it. And it's also extremely bipartisan that people believe that we should be addressing our addiction through the public health system. This is common sense policy. And so this is what it looks like on the ground. Um, my team and I go around the count, uh, the state, checking in with providers, hearing how they're having impacts with these funds. And the stories are um, not only, you know, extremely uh, motivating for us to continue, but it really does just drive home how important making sure that not only are we not criminalizing folks, so we used to arrest about 9,000 people a year for simple possession. We have over the whole span of this, um, so over two years, they have given out, police have given out 4,400 citations. So those are thousands of people who don't have barriers on their records and aren't having barriers to getting housing and employment and all the other stigma that comes along with that. So we're extremely proud of the work that's being done. There's a lot of work obviously to be done moving forward and, and we're working with the legislature right now um, to make some adjustments in the language to make sure that the next time we roll out funding that it is um, done in a quicker manner. So I am going to stop because I think I've gone over time. But really appreciate it and absolutely here to answer any questions or do any follow up. Thank you so much, Tara and Alex, for taking us through Measure 110. Um, you know, many people forget that this is a brand new approach and it takes time to shift systems that have been developed over decades. But it's really exciting to hear how Measure 110 has already provided health services across Oregon with previously unimaginable funds, which means that people have been and will continue to be connected with treatment and a host of other services that people need to stay healthy and safe. We're really eager to continue following Oregon's progress. And again, thank you so much to Joao, Tara, and Alex for sharing what drug possession decriminalization has meant and will continue to mean for the people of Portugal and Oregon. Um, and it is clear that although drug decrim policies of Portugal and Oregon are different, both policies remove criminal penalties such as arrests, police records, prosecution, and jail time for possessing drugs. As Tara mentioned, drugs still aren't legal, but if a person is found in possession, their systems focus on health rather than jail time. And since the passage of Measure 110, we've seen drug possession decriminalization legislation introduced in legislatures all across the country and the world that would remove those criminal penalties for personal use drug possession. So with that all in mind, for the next portion of the event, I'll go ahead and stop the recording so we can proceed with questions from the audience.